comes out to revive us again. Oh, why don't you work like other men do? How the hell can I work when there's no work to do? <laughs> Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah. The history department at the College of Staten Island. And thank you, all 52 of you, for attending this fantastic educational event, Why Strike? A Conversation About Strike Readiness. Uh, I just want to post first a message into the chat going to everybody. Uh, which is in case uh, you need closed captioning, it's available. Obviously, you wouldn't hear me saying this, but uh, we have that available. Uh, I just want to make everybody aware of that. Uh, before I explain what we're doing here tonight, I just want to make a few um, announcements, housekeeping stuff. Uh, one is, uh, if you don't want to be recorded for this event, you should turn off your video and we recommend that you change your profile name so you wouldn't appear uh, as person AB. You could be whoever you want as far as the name is concerned. So for uh, anonymity, if you want to do that, I'd recommend uh, you do that now. The last thing I want to mention is if you're interested in getting more information about uh, the PSC's action group and what we're trying to do here to prepare for strike readiness, uh, Jay Arena advises that you join the CSI Solidarity Listserv. And if you'd like to join that, you should post a non-CSI email in the chat box. Jay will take that down and he'll get in touch with you and add you to that list. So that's a great way to stay informed. So what are we doing here tonight? Uh, the PSC action committee decided we needed to have a conversation about strike readiness and present the question of why strike. And just to give you a little bit of brief context here, we've had an incredibly difficult year globally with the pandemic, also with various governmental policies that have been autocratic and very destructive. We've also seen amazing social movements pushing against those, rising to the challenge, and trying to improve social, cultural, political, educational conditions. Some of my colleagues have asked, well, Mark, why should we even be talking anymore about strike readiness? The state legislature just passed a new budget for CUNY. The union has negotiated and taken a very forward position on some issues, what's the point? And I just want to refer everyone back to the strike preparedness resolution that the union as a whole passed. And this was uh, earlier in January of this year. And among the many things that that included was the demand for free tuition for our students. It also included a call for 5,000 new full-time faculty positions. This is especially important at the College of Staten Island, where we have a very lopsided ratio of full-time faculty to student body. It's also important at CSI because we need to seriously improve the diversity of our faculty. We need to hire more people of color, more Native Americans, more people of a variety of sexual preferences, a variety of religious groups. So we have this challenge. We need more mental health counselors. We need full support for our library databases. We need to uh, ensure that our research faculty have all of the resources, the materials, the grants that they need, as well as for their graduate students. We also need to support our adjunct faculty. Our adjunct faculty, uh, CUNY-wide, over 2,300, were laid off and not hired back due to the pandemic. We also need to support our instructional staff. They've gone through a very difficult year working extraordinary hours. Also, they have had to fight for contractual raises that the administration initially refused to get, give them. So there are many reasons why we need to keep up the pressure on the board of trustees and on the CUNY administration. 
And I just want to conclude by saying, strike preparedness, strike readiness is a political leveraging tool. It's a way to ensure that the existing contract is enforced. It's a way to bring about change to the system. And it's a way to improve the teaching experience, the research experience, the student experience. So we're opening this up tonight with three different presentations. Each person will speak for 15 minutes. First, we'll have Chris Santiago, who's an adjunct professor at the so in the sociology department here at CSI. He'll speak on the attack on public higher education. Then we'll move to Mark Kagan, who's an adjunct professor of history at Lehman. He's also a PhD student at the Graduate Center, writing about the transit workers union's three strikes. He is a former transit worker himself, and he'll be talking about the Taylor Law and what that has to do with striking. And then finally, we'll go to Jay Arena, professor of sociology at the College of Staten Island, who will speak about how do we fight back in these conditions. So uh, I'll turn it over now to you, Chris. Okay, hi everybody. I'm gonna share hey. my screen and start my presentation. So here we are, why strike? Uh, first of all, I'd like to just say that a number of these slides came from uh, Free Cooney and also Rank and File Action, and in particular, Carol Lang, who's here, <laughs> and um, also Connor Tomas Reed, as well as Jay Arena and uh, Shermer, a graduate student from UW Madison. So the history of CUNY, like where does this all start? Um, originally, it was called the Free Academy of the City of New York, established in 1847. That was the first free institution of public higher education in the United States. Townsend Harris founded what was called the Free Academy um, with egalitarian sentiments. Quote, open the doors to all. Let the children of the rich and the poor take their seats together and know of no distinction save that of industry, good conduct, and intellect. Permission for the Board of Education to found the, the Free Academy was ratified in a statewide referendum. This was a radical idea at the time. Uh, Dr. Horace Webster, who was the first president of the Free Academy, he said, quote, the experiment is to be tried, whether the children of the, of the people the children of the whole people can be educated and whether an institution of the highest grade can be successfully controlled by the popular will, not by the privileged few. So city, uh, city College and CUNY, what became CUNY, this was not bestowed on the working class out of the good graces of the bosses or the bourgeoisie, but it came out of the fact that workers had fought for free higher education in New York. So all of us come from a tradition of struggle, and this is how CUNY actually began. And we should all be proud of the fact that we're continuing to fight. So um, CCNY or City College uh, bred student radicalism because of the explosive interaction between the depression, the working class culture of the student body, the larger radical milieu of New York, and the repressive policies of an intolerant campus administration. The students of the 30s were militantly anti-fascist, anti-racist, and anti-war. They say that now we're in the worst downturn since the, since the 30s. And nevertheless, back then, CUNY managed to expand, opening a number of new campuses. In the fall 1970, the class size uh, was larger by 75%. And this was in, including um, dramatically dramatic increasing um, of working class students, including blacks, Puerto Ricans, Italians, Irish, and Poles, what are known as ethnic whites, quote unquote, uh, previously excluded. And this was a real watershed moment where the largest public 
urban university in the, in the United States was transformed by direct action, by people building coalitions of, across their differences in order to create the university that they wanted. This is the closest CUNY ever came to realizing its dream of being a free university of and for the people. So as it says here, they fought to decolonize curric the curriculum and uh, to change CUNY's administration to welcome the majority of people of color students, um, as well as, like I said, ethnic whites. Um, and they won, right? They, it's important to realize that in 1970, CUNY created ethnic and gender studies programs and expanded across uh, access to all students graduating from New York City public schools. It was one of many victories for the social movements of the 1960s. With open admissions and free tuition, CUNY soon graduated more Black and Latino students than any other college system in the United States. <clears throat> However, the counterattack came quickly. In 1975, corporate elites decided to gut New York City's social spending and force, many, uh, force more people to pay for social services. The banks refused to extend credit to New York City unless they made deep cuts to education, healthcare, and other services. This is called austerity or structural adjustment. In the same kind of economic deal, it is the same kind of economic deal that the United States forces onto third world countries through the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. So, well, actually, let me, let me stay here for a second. So the city's budget was put in control of an emergency financial control board, which was made up of bankers and corporate elites. It forced the city to impose tuition at CUNY, to lay off teachers and other public sector workers, and to increase subway fare. They believed that public services should be privatized and run like businesses. This is called neoliberalism. In many ways, it was a test case to see uh, how this could be adopted across the entire United States. So it's also important to see the connection, the kind of historical connection um, with Chile, because Chile was also a laboratory for neoliberalism, um, an experiment in free market reform under dictatorial regime, which promoted private expansion and increased structural inequality. These economic reforms were dreamt up by America's own Chicago boys and hailed as the, the miracle of Chile. This was part of a global attack by the capitalists. Quote uh, from an article that I found, rather than production of wealth, the model has produced rich people, or let's say a few rich people. A similar fate unfolds in New York, or unfolded in New York, CUNY was itself a laboratory for these kinds of shock doctrine measures that the U.S. inflicts upon other countries around the world. So in 1976, it was the first year that the majority of students at CUNY were Black, Latinx, and Asian, but it was also the first year that, in, that tuition was imposed on all students. So now I'm going to uh, turn, I'm going to turn to several slides that give us a picture of the impact that these neoliberal reforms made in the U.S. in particular at CUNY. So this shows the growing uh, income of the top 1% from 1980 to 2015. The first one is the United States on top and then New York State in the middle, and then New York City. And in all of these cases, you can see the dark blue is getting bigger and bigger. For 40 years, the city and state have decreased investment in CUNY, while tuition and underpaid adjunct teaching has increased. Now, student tuition pays for almost half of CUNY's budget and adjuncts are 60% of CUNY's faculty. So 
you see here the the red is tuition and other revenues um, and it's getting larger and larger while state to, state aid and city support are getting smaller and smaller so you could say that public funding decreases as private funding increases <clears throat> Here you have um, the, the number of adjuncts and, and full-time faculty in fall of 2000, um, all the way up to fall of 2017. Now you have to remember that before 2000, um, that previously part-timers made up a small percentage of faculty, but by 2000, it had already increased dramatically. So the number that you're seeing in in 2000 is already an, incre an increase, you know, a great increase. And then if you get to 2017, it's like two thirds are adjuncts and one third are full time faculty. So, you know, yeah. So the adjunctification of the university not only facilitates administration's attacks on shared governance, it's easier to attack a shrinking minority. But it's also, but it also exerts a downward pressure on the salary of the full timers too. Our interests are tied, but if we remain divided, our, our power is neutralized and therefore left vulnerable to attacks like the ones we are facing now. So uh, this is showing that the amount of full-time faculty compared to the amount of students um, is way out of proportion, right? They're, the students, the number of students are going up and the faculty is, I mean, barely going up if, if hardly at all. And so, you know, 42% of CUNY students report not being able to register for classes because no seats were available. 26% report not being able to re register for a class they need to graduate. The lack of full-time faculty means larger class sizes and limited course selection. So you could say that overall, oh, this is for the next one. Um, so this one is showing that overall the public funding has been reduced for students, right? Um, this is both the state aid and the TAP, the financial aid, and per student, per capita, it's, it's going down. Um, so, you know, what does this result in? It results in a neoliberal university, a commodified university, like you can see in this sign that I'm sure many of us have seen around campus, buy one, get one free, as if it's like a commercial. I mean, you know, <laughs> So this one um, is showing the, the tuition going up all over the country. This is a national um, graph, right? From 2008 to 2018, tuition going up. And of course, this, incre this, is a, this also results in a massive increase in student, student debt, right? Student debt is going up, I mean, myself included. Um, and many people I know, we're, we're crippled by the debt that we have because of our educations. <clears throat> and this is showing that state funding has been going down and, and, and is literally um, below pre-recession levels. So, you know, it's important to end with, um, a men you know, we have been fighting this whole time. Many people have been fighting and we need to um, continue to connect the different struggles. Occupy Wall Street, anti-militarization, anti-war, um, Black Lives Matter, 7K or Strike, Free Cooney. These are all very important uh, movements in my opinion, um, recent movements and current movements. Here we have, um, a number of actions done by uh, the PSC. Um, but what I wanna say also is that we need to push further. We need to push harder because um, while this is great, it, it hasn't had the effect that we need. And um, 
that's why we're here today to talk about uh, why to strike. So currently at CUNY, graduation rates are below 50% because students struggle to pay their tuition and bills, as well as succeed in their classes. COVID-19 has made matters much worse, especially for CUNY students and workers of color, many of whom are immigrants who don't qualify for federal stimulus aid. So this brings us to the present moment with the renewed attack uh, with the pandemic and the uh, resulting economic crisis. 20% of CUNY's budget was, was withheld. 3,000, about more than 3,000 adjuncts were laid off this summer. Our measly 2% wage increase was withheld also. Chancellor Matos promises more cuts, quote, I expect more potentially difficult decisions in the near term. Tuition increases in the face of mass unemployment, hunger, and homelessness. How do we respond? And just to finish, just to, to close, um, really what we've been discussing, what I've been discussing is properly called class war. And we should see it for what it is. On a personal note, I'd like to add that I'm currently an adjunct who can barely survive. My girlfriend and I uh, are gonna have to move again. We've moved every year since, I mean, I've moved every year since I was gra graduated in 2005. We're moving into my mom's house, not because we want to. Um, we should, also we would like to have a baby one day, but um, we're gonna have to wait for better health insurance because my partner has an infertility issue and she needs a specialist. Um, and last but not least, I've literally been uh, having an upset stomach as my grandma would say, I've had agita and I, I might have an ulcer, <laughs> literally um, making myself sick over all this. So, um, you know, if we had a stronger union, Fritz wouldn't be able to force this dictatorial governance plan down our throats. Um, we have to expand our vision of what is possible and what is just. We will continue to be pushed around until we stand up for ourselves and each other. The more solidarity we have between faculty, students, staff, and the larger working class, the stronger all of us are. So to close, I'd like to reiterate the point of tonight's teaching is to welcome people into the struggle to make CUNY the kind of university that could be ours, a real true people's university. Thanks. Thank you, Chris, for the historical overview, for the data on the attack on the university, for the uh, past organizing against it, and for your own personal viewpoint about your own situation, and also this call for unity among students, staff, faculty, full-time, and adjunct. I'd now like to turn it over to Mark Kagan. Uh, if you came in late, uh, Mark Kagan is going to speak about the Taylor Law. Uh, he's an adjunct professor of history at Lehman College. He's also a PH, getting his PhD in the Graduate Center. Uh, he's a former transit worker from 1984 to 2003, and he's writing his dissertation on the transit workers' local 100s uh, three strikes. So, uh, Mark, you have the floor. Hi. Uh, good evening. So, um, you know, uh, we just heard Chris talk about the need to push harder and Earlier, uh, Marx talked about uh, strikes or threats of strikes as a political leveraging tool. And those are certainly true. And what is always counterposed on why we can't do this is the Taylor Law. So I'm gonna do three things. I'm gonna talk about the Taylor Law itself, uh, go over some history of how it's been used and then to the extent I have time, some efforts to change it. Uh, and the challenge in this is I'm gonna start talking about the terror laws like being the wet blanket, you know, like being the bad, the bad guest at the party, uh, all gloom and doom. And then I'm gonna try to provide some rays of sunshine. And then I think Jay is gonna really, you know, do that more. Um, and my general premise is that while the purpose of the terror law was to prevent worker and union militancy uh, over its 55 years of existence, 
it's we've really as workers we've become more fearful of action than we should be and it, it's almost like a psychological reluctance to act uh, that's self-imposed and and I think we have to figure out how to break that that psychology of fear and intimidation. So what's the terror law? Uh, there had been a previous anti-strike law in New York called Condon Wadlin. Uh, and, but by the mid 60s, uh, unions were breaking Condon Wadlin. It turned out that it was, the penalties were ironically too high. Uh, you could be fired for uh, striking under Condon Wadlin. And so when social workers struck in 1965 en masse, and when transit workers struck in 1966, uh, you couldn't fire them. You couldn't fire 30,000 transit workers who was gonna run the system. So it turned out that the penalties were too harsh and they needed to come up with a law that had penalties that could be applied, that could sting. And it took them about uh, seven or eight years to, to fine tune the terror law. So broadly, the terror law is a set of laws. It's actually called the Public Employee Fair Employment Act. If you were to Google Taylor law, it'll take you to the act uh, that's supposed to provide labor peace. That's in, in the preface to the law. Uh, on the one hand, it does give New York State public workers the legal right to demand collective bargaining with their employer. It establishes the way workers choose a union, uh, the way it operates, the way the union collects dues. It prohibits management, uh, whoever that is, the state, a city or town, CUNY, for making unilateral changes to contract terms, although I'll note that CUNY did that this year. Uh, um, this is the so-called Tribro Amendment, which I'll come back to, right? So what is our recourse when CUNY violates the Tribro Amendment, right? The, the recourse that the Taylor Law provides is not, well, they violated it, so we can violate it. It's just comply and grieve, which is what the union is doing there. They filed a grievance. Uh, Acuity should not be able to unilaterally break our contract. So the terror law hinders union power by taking away our most potent weapon. And that's a that's the strike, but in Taylor law parlance, a strike is not just what we think of as a strike, right? Uh, but any concerted collective stoppage of work or slowdown by public employees, uh, it can be a, considered a violation of the Taylor law. Um, now, what are the um, what are the uh, sticks that they use against us? Well, workers can be fined an additional day of pay besides, of course, the money they lose from not working. This is the so-called two for one. And unions can be fined for breaking the, the law and then additionally can lose dues checkoff for an indeterminate period of time. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes, what that means. The results have been obviously union weakness. So contracts can go unsettled for years. Uh, in the case of the PSC, we had a contract recently that was that took us six years after expiration to negotiate. In a crisis situation, like for example, COVID, where long-standing contractual procedures no longer work, CUNY can just sit on its hands, right? Like the idea that for us, that the idea that a dispute would be resolved in a year or two is obviously unsatisfactory. The law also limits bargaining to so-called terms and conditions of employment, uh, prohibiting bargaining around issues like uh, free tuition, for example. That doesn't mean that we have to abide by those prohibitions, but it obviously makes it more difficult. So it turned out, so the terror law was passed in 1967, uh, but it didn't prevent strikes. It turned out the UFT Teachers Union struck in 1967 and 68. Sanitation workers struck. Uh, uh, DC 37 and Teamsters struck in 1973. And with each strike, the legislature added penalties to try to make the sting worse. And especially they added penalties against the union, the unions themselves. So Chris mentioned, for example, 
the New York City fiscal crisis in 1975. And that was the last strike, besides transit workers, that was the last strike of any consequence by any union in New York City was a teacher's strike in 1975. And, this, and the, the state at this point really came down hard for the first time on any striking union. As I think this is about like, we're going to ram through this austerity and we're gonna really make the point uh, that we're going to beat you up about this. So the fines against teachers, they were out for a week trying to reduce class sizes which had grown as high as 45 and 50. Frankly, they came back with their tail between their legs. Um, the fines against the teachers actually paid for the rehiring of a couple of thousand laid off teachers. Uh, the strike has been a tax on teachers. That's what the Board of Ed said. Uh, the union was fined for violating the injunction against striking. Uh, the union president, Albert Shanker, uh, was briefly jailed after the strike, although for me, this seems like a mark of honor. Uh, and the union lost its check its dues checkoff for over a year, so it had to collect union dues by hand. Now, what's the issue with this, right? It's not just that it's hard. It's easier actually today because you could sign people up for automatic credit card deduction or automatic withdrawal from their checking account but that if people are ticked off by the outcome of a strike, um, some can decide just simply not to pay. And under those circumstances, uh, they are no longer in good standing in the union. It means they can't run for office, they can't vote in elections. In some unions, they can't even vote on a new contract. And since you owe back dues now, even once the checkoff is restored, which eventually it is, uh, and you're paying dues again, you remain in bad standing uh, until you pay off the back dues, maybe for the rest of your work career. And of course now, uh, uh, due to the Supreme Court Janus decision, people can just stop paying dues entirely, right? If you're in bad standing, what's the motivation then to start again? So for this reason, actually, what we've seen is that the unions are more fearful of striking than the workers themselves. And after 1975, there were no more strikes except for the two transit strikes. So the two transit strikes, 1980, the 11-day 1980 transit strike was objectively a victory. Workers went out, they had been offered a contract, they went out for uh, that time. When they came back, they had won 6% more in wage increases. Those, the, that additional wage increases, paid off the tailored off fines in about a year and a half. And afterwards, of course, that was 6% more forever for those workers. However, however, it turned out that transit workers perceived this strike as a defeat. Why? Well, first of all, the tailored off fines legally have to be taken out between the 30th and 90th day after you return to work. So, and they're taken out of your net pay, not your gross pay. So, uh, so the fines come all at once, boom, right? Whereas the raises take time to accrue and people just had a bad taste in their mouth as well. The union president had not wanted uh, to have this strike. And so he bad mouthed the result. Other union leaders in the city didn't want to bring their, their members out. And so to explain why their members got so much less in that contract round than transit workers, they also had to bad mouth it. So workers came to feel wrongly from kind of an objective standpoint. But again, the psychology is important that they had lost the strike. And that whole generation had to leave transit before workers struck again. I came in as, as Mark said in 1984, four years after that, and really like, all the people that had been on strike, we had to get rid of them before the, before the union, before members were ready to strike again. The 2005 strike is really more of a mixed bag. If 1980 was a defeat, let's call 2005 a draw. Uh, it forced, it's only three days, it forced management to take some concessions off the table. Um, and and it was the first strike of city workers in 25 years. So it broke the idea 
that public workers couldn't strike. And the public relations around it was really good. The polling that was done during the strike showed that uh, more people supported the strike uh, than opposed it. Um, um, maybe broadly, this was against Bloomberg and neoliberalism, right? But the union made a, a number of questionable strategic moves during the strike, and there were, were some concessions in the final contract, and workers voted down the, the contract that they'd been on strike for. And, um, and then something even worse happened, right? The, the fines at first were not so bad. There had been an agreement that the dues checkoff would be would be lost for only four months. But then when the union went into court and said, restore the dues checkoff, uh, Mayor Bloomberg went, came to court and said, uh, and opposed that and said that, that the union needed to make a verbal commitment that it would never go and strike again. The union was reluctant to do that. Um, it went to court, it went to court for, it was in court for 18 months. And finally it lost on the question of like free speech. And finally it lost that it had to make that commitment anyway. And in the meantime, 18 months had passed and half the members, by the end of 18 months, half the members were in bad standing. And today still thousands of those members are in bad standing. Again, this generation of transit workers is soured. So how you come back from a strike is actually important, right? What is the goal? Do members understand the goal? Now, now I'm gonna be more optimistic. That brings us to Hunter Campus Schools where an extraordinary thing happened last summer. This is Hunter Campus Schools is part of our union. They are their own chapter of the union, uh, separate actually from Hunter College. And last summer, CUNY said, uh, we're sending you back to work in September. Uh, you don't have the, we're not giving you any safety data. We're not allowing you to send in inspectors. And the chapter there did an extraordinary amount of organizing over the summer. And, and by the end of the summer, they held a strike authorization vote. And this is a real vote. People were ready to go out. This is the point. This wasn't just some fraudulent vote. People understood that they were not going to report on the first day of work unless they got uh, the safety data, unless they got the inspections. 90% of people voted in the strike. 90% of the members of the chapter voted in the strike authorization vote. 90% of those who voted voted to authorize a strike. And on the last day, it was actually the Tuesday after Labor Day, which was Yom Kippur, uh, CUNY blinked and CUNY allowed the inspections and CUNY handed over the safety data and CUNY made some changes in the configuration of the, of the rooms and certain areas of the, of the, of the school were, were put off limits. The union won not everything they wanted, but 70%, 80% of what they wanted. Um, and and uh, I have, a, my brother actually works there and all summer he was telling me, CUNY just treats us as this pesky fly. But you know what, on that last day on Yom Kippur, uh, they were no longer a pesky fly. And that was because they were ready to go out. And, and the members of that chapter actually met because it was Yom Kippur, that's the reason I'm telling you this. Because it was Yom Kippur, the members did not actually start to meet until like nine o'clock that night to decide whether this was good enough. And they decided it was. And so they, and so they, the strike did not take place, right? Um, so those 125 teachers actually broke the psychological barrier of public employees that you can't strike or that transit workers are the only ones that can strike. I think that's really important. It's not just that there have been no strikes, but that there's been no readiness or willingness to strike if necessary. This tool that can change the balance of power has been lost and we need to put it back in our toolkit and decide when to take it out and use it, right? And actually that's about mindset as well as the law. And actually this evening, uh, rank and file action um, is holding a sick out assembly 
to discuss at CUNY-wide SICAP, as well as other possible job actions. That's, I'm just quoting from their email. So one last thing is while we're trying to put the tool back in our toolkits and not be afraid to strike, we should also be fighting politically to change the terrible law. Now, this is not as fanciful as it seems. For example, there is no prohibition on public employees striking in uh, 12 states, including California, Illinois, Pennsylvania, where unions have the right to strike. And you know what? The sky has not fallen down in those states. And it's one reason why teachers unions in Chicago and LA have been able to wage effective strikes. Cynthia Nixon ran for governor uh, three years ago advocating for repeal of the terror law. Unfortunately, most unions were so scared of Cuomo that they, that they refused to support her and some even mocked her, right? But perhaps with a supermajority, a democratic supermajority in the state legislature, we should begin to chip away at the terror law, amending the law in various ways. And let me suggest some ideas. One thing would be to expand the scope of bargaining. You know, this is the so-called bargaining for the common good, where workers and unions have been able to build community support by advocating for the communities as well. It would be nice to do that here, to be able to advocate for free tuition. And I think, to me, like a strike has to be combined with a demand for free tuition. We have to explain to the public what, why this is, why our strike is in their interest too. Uh, other suggestions I've heard that uh, work actions be allowed around imminent uh, serious health and safety issues, that, um, that workers be allowed to go on to, to take action without needing the union's permission, which would relieve the union of the fear of fines, uh, that, that, if, that if employers acted in bad faith, such as withholding the contractual raise, that unions could then strike without penalty. Um, and finally, let me just finish with this, right? There's, there's, I mentioned the Triborough Amendment before, this idea that, that management is not allowed to unilaterally change uh, change the contract, change the wages, change the health benefits, whatever else is negotiated for without bargaining and without coming to agreement. And, it, and that was supposed to be like the trade-off for not being able to strike. So would you give up that trade-off? Uh, believe it or not, in 1977, Governor Hugh Carey proposed that trade-off. We'll give you, he told the unions, we'll give you back the right to strike if if you give up the Triborough Amendment, if, if the city, if the state can unilaterally change uh, the contract when it expires, as, as like is true in private industry. Um, and at the time, unions actually chose to decline this offer, right, remarkably. They, they preferred a defensive posture rather than an offensive one. And this was a mistake uh, in my view not just because the trade-off hasn't worked to our benefit, but because it's encouraged learned helplessness. So from 1967, when the terror law went into effect to 1981, 14 years, there were 297 strikes in New York State. The terror law did not stop strikes, 20 or more a year. From 1982 to 1997, there were just 33. And since then, two a year. And since then, there have been even fewer. There were no substantive changes to the law between those two periods. What's happened was that unions and members have been accustomed, have become accustomed to the terror law provisions and we've trimmed our sails. It's like our collective common sense, but common sense can be changed. And that's what forums like this are about and what the union's efforts at strike readiness are about. And I'll just finish by saying, that the first PSC union meeting I ever attended was at the Graduate Center. And a, a famous labor academic, Stanley Aronowitz was there. And he stood up and he said, a union that gives up the right to strike is no union. Um, so I'll leave it at that, thank you. Mark, thank you very much for that informative presentation about the history for stressing the importance of breaking the psychological barrier 
for explaining the importance of how you come back from a strike and also uh, going over all of those rich possibilities of the need to change the Taylor law and uh, ways to expand the scope of bargaining. So I think that gives us a lot to chew on. Uh, last, we're going to go to uh, Professor Jay Arena in the sociology department here at CSI, who's going to talk about how do we fight back. Jay, you have the floor. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. So Chris uh, did an excellent presentation on the decades-long attack that we have faced at CUNY and, and therefore why we should strike. And Mark has uh, outlined all the barriers that the rulers have created to prevent us from exercising our real power, the, the right to strike to what Stanley Aronowitz, uh, our precursor here at uh, our department at CSI, uh, is the, the essence of a union. And they've also tried to block uh, exercising even the demands that we've raised, that we can raise. So what I wanna talk about is how within that context um, that we need to strike, how we need to strike. And the first step, the most elemental step, the most important step is that we need to strike over what we want rather than what we have been told is acceptable, what is permissible, right? That's the lesson of history from past social movements. The only way people have made progress is when they fight for what they want rather than what they have been told is accept, uh, acceptable. So in our context, that means we need to be fighting for the working conditions broadly defined that we need to deliver quality education to our students, to, as Chris uh, uh, quoted from the mission of CUNY, to teach the whole people, right? And so we can't, in defining those demands that we strike over and get strike ready over, um, we, we have to fight for what we want. And so the first key demand we have to, that we would be striking over is to end the destructive two-tier adjunct full-time system that we have, where the overwhelming majority of, of faculty, uh, and even more so who actually teach courses, are super exploited adjuncts. Chris outlined his conditions, low pay, uh, very few or none uh, job protection or, or benefits, right? And that obviously is destructive, uh, as Chris talked about his own personal troubles that we can multiply many times over for those workers in those positions, but it's also not good for the students, right? Because although the adjunct faculty are very uh, well prepared, they don't have the working conditions to provide the quality education that our stu students need. And it also hurts the full-time, the, the shrinking number, the shrinking island of full-time tenure and tenure track professors. Chris went over a number of, it puts more work on us, it drives down our power and our working conditions, our, our pay. Uh, it also leaves us open to, for these attacks that we're facing right now at CSI with this authoritarian uh, leader president that we have that's gutting um, a shared governance. We have been made an easier hit because we are a minority. Uh, the adjuncts don't really uh, uh, enjoy share in shared governance. So this is an attack on all. So we need to end. That's a key demand that we need to be striking over. End this two-tiered system. Equal pay for equal work. And on top of that, a mass hiring. We need more uh, full-time faculty to be hired to reduce the student-faculty ratio. Number two. We need to provide, to provide quality education, we need to strike over a massive expansion in the number of academic advisors and mental health counselors for our students uh, to provide the quality education that we need. Number three, we need to strike over, because uh, we strike over what we want, not what we have been told is permissible. We need to strike over a return to a free CUNY, as, as Chris explained, from 1847 to 1976, CUNY was, was free. Uh, since then, they've been you know, instituting these, this tuition, which it makes it very difficult for me to teach, to provide a quality education. When I have my students working 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, they cannot focus on their studies. I cannot teach them, or it, makes, it becomes very difficult to teach 
under those conditions. So we need a, a return to a free CUNY. We need number four, our, we need to strike over a massive refurbishing and rebuilding of our infrastructure, of our classrooms, of the schools that are falling apart, right? And that is particularly important in this context of a pandemic to be able to return safely to the classrooms. We need a redone HVAC systems. We need a whole restructuring of those of those facilities that we know from where I work at 4S, I haven't seen it in two years, but I know I remember the conditions to Brooklyn College and uh, across the CUNY system are collapsing. So we need a massive rebuilding and with three higher ed, we are gonna have an increase in the number of students and we're gonna have to have a rebuild and an expansion of the facilities. Number five. If anything, we have learned from this pandemic is that our working conditions do are not limited to the classroom, but extend to the living conditions of our students. The living conditions of our students are our working conditions. They reverberate back into the classroom. So we need free quality health care for all. We needed it before, but particularly now. And we're not, as people are increasingly saying, we're not going back to the disastrous pre-pandemic times. We need a new, a new system. We need an end to the terrorizing of ICE immigration cops, La Migra, that terrorize our immigrant working class students when they organize, when their parents organize. The ICE is brought in to shut down those organizing efforts. New York State, and this is the demand on New York State, ICE operates here and there's a whole system of co ICE concentration camps. Right now in New Jersey, there is a major uh, hunger strike of immigrants that are being held in the Democratic Party run ICE concentration camps in New Jersey. They are now being hauled over to the ICE gulag system in New York to shut down the protests. So to protect our students, to provide quality education, that terror comes into our classroom. We need to shut down ICE. We need also, this has also been underscored by the pandemic, we need quality housing for all. The overcrowded conditions have resulted, especially in working class immigrant communities, the spreading of the virus that comes into the classroom, literally. And so we need quality, uh, housing for all, a right to housing, a mass expansion of the public uh, housing. And, you know, it, my uh, photograph uh, here, here on Zoom in the background is from this past summer. A number of my comrades here, Ale Alex, who I see is out here, Ruth, a number of others, um, were part of the car caravan protest this summer. We ended at the uh, President Fritz's swanky home in uh, the Tote Hill neighborhood of Staten Island. He has a nice place uh, and I think they're they're gonna they're putting it on the market right now. I say let's keep that as public property and provide that for students. But we need quality um, quality housing for all. We need quality mass transit. Those are things that we need to strike about. Striking for the common good, right? Striking for the entire class. Those are what we go out for. Now we also need, I'm not finished, we need jobs for our students, right? That's part of, of a quality education for the, the working conditions for me. I have to underscore for these students that they are studying hard for a well-paying, socially productive, socially useful job. And there's plenty of work. That's the other thing the pandemic has underscored. There's plenty of work to be done. What we need is a mass direct government employment, public works and public service program to provide services for all. And I want to underscore as well the connection to fighting racism. You know, I'm a scholar of post-civil rights black politics. And one of the, the, the major uh, racist attacks has been the assault on the public sector that, that Chris outlined uh, magnificently looking at CUNY, but this has been more broadly. And one of the gains of the civil rights movement was the opening up of the public sector. And so that attack, that assault, on the public sector has been against the working class, but deeply racist. And so this is crucial. There's, there's scholars like Adolph Reed and others 
had talked about an expansion of the public of the public sector. So that's what we need to be fighting for. And then six, we need to be striking for. And this is the million, well, maybe I should say the billions of dollar question. How is this going to be funded? And I probably are thinking, oh, these are all nice. Where's the money going to come from? Well, from the billionaires, from the super rich, who over the last several decades have overseen this massive uh, redistribution of wealth. And some of my students are in my 260 class. We're reading Les Leopold's work, Runaway Inequality, that goes over the mechanisms that's created that. But that has not ended, and it only has accelerated under the pandemic. Now, I am not going to bombard you with statistics, but let me just throw a few out here. There are 657 billionaires in the United, just in the United States. Over the last year, they have seen their wealth increase uh, to the tune of 1.3 trillion, that's with a T, trillion dollars, a 45% increase, right? In New York State alone, uh, we have 120 billionaires. Now, Eric Lerner has done some research on the, the bailout, the massive bailout last year by the Federal Reserve of Wall Street, right? Remember Wall Street, it collapsed. It's now double its value that it was last year because of the massive infusion into the markets and their stock buybacks and their other schemes. We've calculated the take from the super rich in New York was $630 billion. So that's just from that robbery that has gone on in the last the last, the last year with the pumping up of Wall Street, let alone the massive redistribution that we've seen over the last several decades. So obviously to get that back short of a social revolution, we need a wealth tax. Now for working class people, there is a wealth tax. What's it called? If I was in a classroom, I'd have you respond. So it's, 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 a, uh, it's a property tax right on your home. That's the major source of wealth of those that have it of, of a, for, for working class people. But for for the super rich, it comes in the form of what's called intangible property. And they've included that in the, the New York State Constitution to bar taxation. So obviously that needs to go and we need to strike over that, right? So the only way to claw that money back is through a wealth tax, uh, you know, five to 10%, uh, 10 million and above to claw that back. Now, some, so these are the, these are the, this is the bargain, the striking for the common good the striking for class-wide demands that we need to be fighting for. That's what I'm arguing for. Now, some groups, there's a group called CUNY Rising, the CUNY Rising Alliance that includes the PSC. It include, we've had a number of them have presented at our union meetings. Um, it includes some other public sector unions and some nonprofit groups. And they've raised some of these demands, not as, as expansive as what we're arguing for here, but they've raised some of these demands, but they've only limited, been limited to lobbying, to meeting, to pleading with the, legis the state legislature to in implement some of these. As we've seen with the last um, budget, now Mark, you, you pointed to the, the gains, but the fact is for CUNY, it didn't get really anywhere. All we got was a $500 increase in the TAP, uh, the TAP gap uh, between the TAP uh, financial support and what the tuition here, which, which we should get rid of. Uh, they closed that gap a little bit and there was an increase on the income, uh, an increase on the income taxes of the, of the super wealthy, not the wealth tax. But there really, there wasn't even a, a, acknowledged by our outgoing PSC president, uh, Barbara Brown. it was not the transformative budget that they've been they've been talking about. So that's what we need to do. We need to be, we, those are some of good demands. They need to go much farther, but we need to be bargaining and striking over these, right? right? We're not limited by, the, by the, the strike prohibition. We can't, right? And we can't be limited by what they say we can raise. We have to fight for what we want. And we have examples of this, right? Recent examples. Mark was talking about the 1980s and the 2005. I'm an old guy. That seems like yesterday, but for some of my students, that might seem like ancient history. But we have 2018 in West Virginia, where my son used to live. He moved out of there. But they had a, and that's a much more hostile environment, labor environment, than in New York for public sector workers. It's illegal to strike. It's illegal for collective bargaining. And nonetheless, the low paid public school teachers 
went out on a mass strike, not only fighting for their miserably, against their miserably low wages, but for a massive infusion of funds into public education against charter schools and privatization, for other uh, support workers in the public schools they were fighting, and for that the rich pay. It's not the coal barons anymore in West Virginia, it's the, the oil barons. And so it was about a, 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 a wealth tax, a corporate tax to, to pay for their demands. Now, why didn't Jim Justice, ironically called the governor, billionaire, why didn't he hammer? Why didn't he come down? He had those tools. He could have fired them, fined them, done a lot of things, but he didn't. Why is that? Because it was fear, right? As a mass strike, a potential mass strike, there was fear if they hit repression that this would expand, right? And someone posted about Rosa Luxemburg, the same thing Rosa Luxemburg talks about. When movements are growing and, and uh, unflinchingly fighting for what they want and bringing in larger layers, repression almost usually has the opposite effects, that it actually expands the strike. And he was playing with dynamite. And so they did win most of their demands. It was, it was, a, major, it was a major victory. And so what do we do here, right? Um, we need, again, what, what we, we call a mass strike, what Rosa Luxemburg, uh, she was an activist, a, uh, uh, a theoretician, a, a, a intellectual, just like us. Uh, we're commemorating the 150th anniversary of her birth. And she wrote about the mass strike, which is the process, right, through which uh, labor has been organized in the United States and in other, in other, in other places globally, right? And she argues with a mass strike, there's, there's, uh, you can't call it into being, right? You can't just snap your fingers and a, a mass strike is gonna happen, but you can kind of uh, prepare the soil, help prepare the conditions for which it might emerge, right? And one of the key things, and we see, and, and we've had some features of a mass strike in West Virginia, it came from below, right? Mass demands, it wasn't from the union leadership, like here, right? That strike resolution, the PSC leadership was coming kick, kicking and screaming um, to pass that, right? It, that came from the ranks. It came from below, right? But another key thing for successfully launching a, a mass strike is that we have these broad encompassing demands, right? That address the broad sectors of the working class, right? That unites are various movements. You know, I mentioned uh, labor educator Les Leopold. He talks about how we have a lot of different silos. So we've got the immigrant rights silo, we've got the uh, um, anti war silo, US hands off Venezuela or Ecuador, we've got the uh, environmental climate change silo, we've got anti police brutality silo, we've got a variety of silos, but we don't really have any power and traction until we can kind of unite with some common demands, broad demands, and none of our struggles are gonna be, we have to be clear, and Leopold underscores that, I think there's an increasingly consciousness around that. And all these demands are, have become common sense in many ways, but the only way that we can make advances in any of these silos is taking back the trillions that have been stolen. That's a bottom, a bottom line demand. And to be able to do that, to unlock that, to change the constitution, you're not gonna change to get a wealth tax in New York doing visits to your local assemblyman. I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. You gotta build, at least have a serious strike, strike threat to do that. And so we've got to be able to unite those movements and with those broad demands, that makes it more likely for that to unfold as, as Luxembourg talked about. Okay, so I really wanna hear the questions, but let me just throw out some ideas. So how do we get to move there? So obviously, making those demands. That's an elemental but crucial first step, fighting for what we want, not what we have been told is permissible. And all those demands that I outlined have become common sense. These, but we've got to be able to fight for them and put them on the, uh, on the agenda. So how do we start Jay, moving toward that? Jay, Jay can, you, can you briefly wrap up? Because yeah, I yeah, think so let me, one minute, one minute, one minute. Like to to okay. Yeah, one minute. So one is we should have popular assemblies to uh, of students and CUNY workers to put forward these demands, democratically debate and vote on them, and then begin, and we should encourage other unions and other 
broader sectors of the working class to do the same thing, popular assemblies. And we need uh, democratically run strike committees where there's delegated democracy, not this representative you trust people for so many years, direct democracy, delegates from each department, uh, and then it leads up to a CUNY-wide CUNY -wide committee. Um, just a few others, we need strike a strike fund, we need alternative dues check off. Some of the things Mark's brought up, we need study groups. We need to, we need theory and, you know, we need to study Luxembourg and some of the past strikes and successful strikes that have been unleashed. And we need some initial actions, uh, what Jane McAlevey calls structure tests. But I'll end right there and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay. Thank you very much, Jay, for uh, your outlining uh, these demands and then uh, talking about your views on the best way to get it uh, to get there politically. And you've, uh, I think, invited a lot of questions here. So what I'd like to ask from everybody is you have two ways you can ask a, a question or be recognized. Uh, down in your Zoom window on the bottom, uh, if you go to reactions, there's a raise hand button. If you raise your hand there, I'll try to keep track of everybody among our 60 participants and uh, take questions there. Also, if you have a question and you prefer to just write stack in the chat, uh, you can do that too. So I'm gonna start with uh, the ones I first saw in the stack and then I'll, uh, in the chat, and then I'll go to the two hands raised. So uh, I just want to start, I think the first time I saw a stack in the chat is Spartacus at 717. So you can turn on your uh, mic and ask your question, please. Um, I mean, thank you for recognizing me. I mean, thank you for some really um, well-prepared, well-organized and inspiring presentations. I'm really happy to be in this kind of a milieu. Um, and I say yes to all that was said. Um, I mean, just to move things a little forward over here. Um, I mean, one question that I had for Mark, maybe, Ma maybe Mark can clarify that. Um, I'm, somewhat, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat unclear on the exact date on which the Taylor law was implemented. Like from my readings of labor history, uh, from my readings of uh, different people, it seems that the date was 1947. Um, and then in another context, I read 1957. And now you say 1967. So I'm slightly confused by those, uh, uh, I mean, by those dates. Uh, if you have some clarification to offer, I would gratefully appreciate it. Um, that's one question. The other- no, Ganesh, Ganesh, so that we have enough time for everyone. Can we just start with that question and then we'll have Mark answer that and then we'll go down the list? Okay, thank you. No, Mark, Mark, you want to feel that, please. Mark, just to clarify, we're going to take the questions one at a time. Yeah, for now, let's take them one at a time uh, so that we can give everybody some space and then we'll see if we need to combine. Sure. As I said, the, the earlier uh, anti-strike legislation, Condon-Wadlin, was 1947. So that may be where that date is coming from. But there was a social workers strike in 1965 that, and, and the transit workers strike in 1966 that showed that it was, um, that it was unviable anymore. And, the, uh, and Governor Nelson Rockefeller convened a group of labor relations experts, among them George Taylor, in early 1967. They proposed the law uh, on, you know, normally, uh, laws are, are named after the legislators, the legislators that passed them, but no legislator wanted their name on this law. So it wound up getting known as, as the terror law after the head of the panel that, that proposed it. And that was in 1967. Thank you, Mark. Uh, okay, so just to let everybody know where I'm going here, I think I see Michael Paris next in the stack. So we'll go to Michael. Then I'm going to go to Carol Lang. Then I'm going to go to Pete Seeger. Then I'm going to go to Harry Kaysen. So if we can uh, start with you, Michael Paris. Thanks, Mark. I would suggest a time limit on questions and comments, uh, minute, two minutes maybe. Uh, I want to thank all three of the presenters for really powerful, well thought out, provocative presentations. Chris, Mark, Jay, thank you so much. This, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. This was fantastic. I just want to make a comment. And um, I don't particularly want to argue it right now. I'm happy to argue it, but, um, and it's in response to Jay Arena's comment. And I want to disagree with Jay. I want to say that I agree with everything he said. <laughs> However, 
if you approach people with that speech, you may not get as far as you would get if you took a more process-based approach, which leaves open to the process, the statement of actionable and achievable goals and how you get from here to there. The 10 point program approach that Jay takes, which is the, the powerful moral statement about what is indeed just and fair, um, I believe doesn't get you as far as more of a commitment to process and open-ended and an open-ended approach to the level, the degree, the power, the achievability of goals. And that you organize people by giving them a sense of their own participation and agency in formulating what they're about. So, you know, Jay and I have always had this conversation and it's about process and framing, not about what the ideal society looks like so much, although I'd probably be a little more skeptical about some of the broader claims that, that, that Jay makes. I'm, I'm a old fashioned European social Democrat type, right? So I just want to throw that out there because Jay, Jay does not speak for the union as a whole. Jay speaks for Jay and Michael Paris speaks for Michael Paris. Um, this is not a union sanctioned position that's been articulated here. And the union is a democratic process of sorts. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Jay, would you like to respond for one minute and then we'll move down the I'll line with be, other questions? Yeah, I'll just, be, I mean, it was more a comment than, than question, but I mean, the, the fact is these are demands that have become common sense, right? The free higher ed, um, a, you know, even the Biden administration, they're, reser they're talking about, how are they going to push it through? They're talking about the resurrecting the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, higher taxes on the rich. Those, these are overwhelmingly supported if you look at polls, right? Um, and we have to, I mean, I am part of the union. The union is the member. The, and this action committee has been officially sanctioned by the, uh, by the, by the leadership. So we, the, we, a union is not a thing. It's not a bureaucracy. It's not a treasury. It's the, the, the people. And, and as Stanley Aronowitz, who did used to teach at CSI in our department, the precursor in Richmond College, uh, said, you're, you're not a union unless you're, a bit, you're able to strike. And so what we're arguing here is how do you get to a strike? And I think the, to get people there, you got to have a strategy. You got to have a serious strategy. And, and the, these class-wide demands, what we're arguing, is a way that you can really build power. That's being realistic. Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, let me go to Carol Lang, and then I'll go to Pete Seeger, and then to Harry Kaysen. So Carol Lang, please. Hi, thanks, thanks. Um, I just want to mention just very quickly that in 1969, there was a student strike, which all of this, th these things, once I think Mark is right, once you believe it's so, it certainly could happen. Up until 1969, CUNY was white. After 1969, people of color, and ironically, more white people got a chance to get into CUNY after that strike. In 1989, there was another strike which rolled back the tuition. Once again, people began to believe that they had power and could do it. The problem for me is the leadership of our union, which is basically did exactly what Mark said, which has prevented us from striking. With all the strike resolutions that we have come up with, they have undermined it at every single moment. And so the question is, is not getting, we have to deal with them. We have to figure out what to do to deal with a, a union leadership that really essentially doesn't want us to strike because they're afraid of union power. Um, so Rafa, which is a group that I belong to, and I came here really to, to try to get sol solidarity because we're really trying to do the same thing. We've organized tonight a sick out assembly as a step towards ultimately having a strike, which is exactly what Jay is calling for. But I think the process is important. So how are we gonna get people to participate in this movement towards a strike? And so we have now tonight, I don't know how many people have shown up, the, the beginnings of a sick out that we're hopefully will be called, uh, I'll, I'll 
you know, wrap up in a minute, that hopefully we can get together that will ultimately lead to the question of power, which will lead to a question of a strike. So I'd like to extend solidarity to everybody who's here to take a look at what we're proposing and come to meetings that we're having and, you know, put forward whatever it is that you feel like you need. But we are, we're trying to get the ball rolling because we obviously must ultimately strike in order to be able to even win the demands that, you know, Jay has elucidated here. So anybody who wants to have any, any information about it, please email me, get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And also, if you uh, want to put your organization's information in the chat, that would be a good way. I, um, I want to go to Pete Seeger's question, which is addressed to Mark Kagan. The question is, I'd like to ask Mark Kagan to share what he believes were the ingredients of success for the Hunter School strike, what concrete steps prepared them for striking, and got them to a situation where they were almost all ready to strike. But that's a good question. And first, let me just say, Pete, I've loved your work over the, the decades and, uh, and your commitment over the decades to social action. Um, so uh, I think there are, there are a number of factors. First of all, it, it did matter um, that, that they were teachers and, and they see each other every day. And so there's more bonding. There's, it's easier for the group of them to bond than perhaps it is for faculty who are on and off campuses, right? As let's say workers in a factory. So you see each other all the time. You see each other for you know, six or eight hours a day. That's important. Uh, the second thing is that this union chapter had been, nonetheless, right? The union chapter had been dead in the water for years. And then the, the guy that was the, the chapter chair retired and a new person took his place and she like is a dynamo and she immediately began reaching out to other people and saying get involved get involved and over the maybe the previous three years they took on the administration over three or four things and won or pushed back or seemed to have victories and that's important right that in that that encouraged the membership, which had been pretty passive, to see that if they were that if they acted, whether it's petitions or mass meetings or um, whatever, that they could have an effect. The third thing was a CUNY recalcitrance, right? Like if the boss is just says no, no, no. In some ways, it's easier to mobilize people than if they smile at you. Uh, uh, and and of course, the fact that there was fear of death here mattered. Like the consequences of not fighting back were severe. And then finally, uh, they just organized for three months. They just organized, right? They phone trees and calling people and, and two, two, like two meetings every week of the entire faculty to say, what has happened in the, next, in the last three days? You know, and to listen to people as well, right? And to gauge where people were at, right? So this is, I, I write about this and the idea of on the one hand leadership and on the other hand rank and file uh, movement and, and them being coordinated with each other, right? The leadership listening to the rank and file and the rank and file having trust in the leadership. And finally, I, I don't wanna referee between um, you know, Michael Paris and Jay, but I do think that when Jay says common sense demands you know, that's an important thing. And, and we can debate what is a common sense demand, but, but to these group of workers, these demands were very common sense. Thank you, Mark. Next, Harry Kaysen. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. And it's great to see uh, a lot of familiar faces. Um, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, I, uh, really think that the first thing we need to do is actually get a, ma a large amount of community support that understands why we're doing what we're doing, what, uh, what we want to do, and why. Um, it, without community support, uh, we will not have 
full-time uh, full faculty support, which, which has been a long time problem. Uh, I worked on this issue for 10 to, 50, to nearly 15 years, and I decided to just go do other things because I had lost uh, complete faith <clears throat> in, in the union um, being there uh, for us. And so um, uh, the, the, both the, the full-timers right now, is, um, my guess is that there's probably a lot more, there's more than 60% on this call are adjuncts uh, than, uh, than there are full-timers. So um, we have, a, if we get community support and, the, and, and as Jay said, we should be advocating um, for free tuition and that's how you get um, uh, good uh, community support. And uh, that would be um, a, a strategy, I think, that, that would give us the, um, the standing uh, uh, to, to survive the onslaught of the state. So uh, uh, that would be my best uh, suggestion after having thought about this for years. Thank you, Harry. Uh, now I'd like to go to Aslam Gunner, uh, professor of sociology here at CSI. Maybe a quick plug, author of Turkish National Identity and Its Outsiders, uh, published by Routledge, 2017. Um, thank you, and thank you for that uh, recognition. I, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also try to keep this brief. And I think the question of tactics and strategies is one that we need to spend a whole meeting on. And I do uh, understand that they even need to be made more concrete, right? Jay's is the first step um, to suggest that we need to um, connect to our students. We need to connect to their struggles. We need to connect the unions. We need to connect um, to the um, you know, issues that would appeal to the larger, broader working class in at least the city that we're living at. And I think, you know, in terms of uh, the radicalness of these demands, I, I constantly run across this, this debate. And I have a, um, I want to make a suggestion. I feel like sometimes, at least among the full-timers, uh, some of these demands, maybe because we have things to lose, maybe because we are actually at a position uh, that makes us, you know, um, more scared of losing the things that we have, that certain things to connect to the broader struggles make us sound as if these are radical demands. But I just want to make a suggestion that sometimes these are much more popular than we need, especially, you know, in the past uh, decade, that these demands have been much more popularized than we realize in our circles of full-timer academics who are in a, an interesting fashion, in my experience of like labor and labor struggles and their understanding of it, I have witnessed more conservatism than, for example, conversations with students, conversations on the street, conversations. And sometimes the point that I'm going to make is that the seemingly radical demands, because they appeal to so many more people, are actually easier to go with and easier to popularize. Um, and, and these are things to discuss, you know, reading groups or discussions of how to make these concrete um, and also action, how to act and make these connections between unions uh, will be quite important. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that actually keeping our demands as broad and as seemingly radical as they are, they may be popular, much more easier to popularize among CUNY workers, students, city, and broader working class, then just some demands around PSC CUNY and our pay and our raises and our, you know, adjunct faculty, that it only makes sense to the broader uh, population if we make those connections. So they're more sensible in that sense and in a way even more pragmatic than we realize. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric Lerner. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is more a comment than a question, and uh, I'm not associated with CSI. I'm uh, associated with Jobs and Equal Rights for All, although uh, I, I'm the descendant. My father was a City College alumnus. But I think this point about 
the psychology of fear is very important at this point. The fact that, you know, Jay was talking about the example of the West Virginia teachers' strikes and saying, well, this isn't ancient history. I don't know. I bet to most people, this already does feel like ancient history, even though it's, it's really three years ago. We've gone through a lot of history. And I think that it's really important to get the point out to all the layers that we're organizing that victories are possible in this present time through a mass strike process. And the fact that all of us are now, you know, uh, meeting online, I think gives us an opportunity to broaden the discussion geographically. I mean, I just think that, you know, it would be great to have people at CSI and elsewhere in CUNY maybe organize a national teach-in on the theme of victories, are, you know, that uh, recent victories and get some of the West Virginia teachers, some of the other people in the teachers movement. We've had a few victories in the uh, private sector to talk about how these happened almost always against repression. Almost all of these strikes were, uh, strictly speaking, illegal strikes. And this would start by concrete examples within the very recent past to break through the idea, gee, this sounds great, but it's pie in the sky and it's never going to happen in the 21st century United States. We have to get people who lived through this uh, to talk about their experiences and how in the present day they have overcome these, these obstacles and why. Thank you, Eric Lerner. Uh, I'd like to next go to uh, Professor Rosalind Bollock, a uh, professor of sociology at CSI, uh, author of Dialectical Phenomenology, Marx's Method, and also Love or Greatness, Max Weber and Masculine Thinking, a Feminist Inquiry. Uh, thank you. Um, I have just a, a kind of a, a tiny little question, and uh, I don't know if, it, if, if it's uh, relevant or useful, but I really uh, liked Jay's phrase um, that uh, our students' living conditions are our working conditions. And one thing that I've never heard anybody address at CUNY is the fact that New York State has guidelines that for every three credit course students are supposed to put in, I forgot now what the, um, the, the matrix is, but uh, X number of hours at home. So a 15 credit full-time load together with the homework would come to 40 hours. Now we have students who are working 40 hours and coming to class for three and for for you know uh, x number of classes, and then they're expected, according to New York State rules, to be putting in for every three hour class. I forgot what it is, something like five hours of homework, which means they can essentially you know it's, I don't know how long it would take them to possibly get a degree while they're working, and it's a it's a real conflict and contradiction in terms of our working conditions being their living conditions, how do we uh, uh, deal with that? Uh, so I don't know if this is really the, the, uh, the best venue for raising it, but I, I really liked that, that line. Thank you. Can I just respond to a couple of the questions, uh, Mark? Yeah, pl please okay. go ahead. Uh, yeah, and Jay, uh, if, if I could give you about a, a minute and a half and then I see well, Professor Tritcher has another question, so please. Okay, well, we're good. Yeah, and you know, we do have a little, we have extra time. You know, if people are going to want to continue past eight o'clock. We, we extended the Zoom session. So, uh, just on the point, uh, you know, Roz, uh, Oslam, and uh, Eric made, uh, you know, I, I think we should be striking over the whole set of demands. But 
clearly a key tactic is uniting with our students. You know, we, we read uh, Frances Fox Piven, her classic article on disruptive, disruption power, disruptive power, and, and uh, uh, un unleashing that disruptive power. And one of the th key things that she says is that key to successfully unleashing a strike is that you activate the other relationships that, that workers are in. Obviously for us, the most important one, numerically, politically, strategically, is with students. We have an organic relationship. And that's one thing, you know, I'm a little uneasy of, you know, I wanna be outside the classroom, that's our fight, but we do need to get back in because that's a political question of maintaining those bonds. And so Piven talks about, well, how do you activate that? How do you bring, because they could turn against us, right? Um, that's the word, or neutral. But ideally, you want them on your side. You want them striking on your side. Well, key to that is common demands. And, and again, you know, consciousness does change. And that's what Eric has is, is, is brought up. But, but that has become common sense, the idea of free tuition, the obscenity of, of burdening our young people and some older people, it continues with them, with these enormous debts, right? The, 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 the powerful graph that Chris uh, used of the cuts in state aid, you can almost track that dollar for dollar for every state uh, cut in, in public uh, higher education funding has been added to uh, st student debt, which has skyrocketed in the post 2008 period. So that's gonna be strategic, that's key is, is uh, striking over those demands. Uh, that's a bottom line. And yes, we have to divide the Taylor Law and including the limits on the scope of bargaining. I mean, why did they put those in there? Obviously our strike is a, is a source of power. They wanna take that away. And that's why they gave the power to the union bureaucracy to kind of prevent strikes. But also a key source of our power, particularly in the public sector, is to raise demands around the, 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 those that we provide service for. I don't like to use the customers because it sounds too businesslike, but Mark Kagan's kind of used that in the past, so <laughs> I'll take that. But we have to. And I want to give my opportunity for my student, Chris Bennett, who's in my class power. We, we read uh, Francis Fox Piven. Uh, and he had a, a comment, and I wanted to encourage him to speak. Um, yeah. Jay, if it's okay, yeah. um, just okay. Yeah, I don't want to what order the people. Here, uh, give them a chance. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jay, um, would it be, uh, let's see, uh, Ganesh and Harry had their hands up. Uh, Ganesh and Harry, would it be okay if uh, we uh, have you delay for just a minute? and then... For someone that hasn't spoken yet. Sure, sure, no, no problem. For me. Yeah, that's fine with me too. Okay, so go ahead. All right, so basically what I said was a way to possibly get students on board, like Professor Arena said, would be to find a common struggle. And a lot of the students, since, since there is less students um, paying like the tuition, and tuition is a struggle that students pay have to pay for and on top of it there's already the students in other boroughs were paying for tolls gas and then on top of that paying for the ca uh, par campus parking that you also I think have to pay for so if you can find a common ground with students with the transportation which is the main thing once everything opens again the main thing is transportation and parking because there's already a big parking crisis on the campus and trying to find a way to unite like with tolls, trying to fight, I guess, tolls and just the ways that all the different things that the students have to pay to first get into the campus in general. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and just, uh, I think I see another student comment, important for everybody here. Melania Nunez had commented, I'm a full-time student and worker. I work 58 hours a week juggling school and work is challenging. I want my education and I have to feed my children. Uh, Ganesh, you wanted to uh, have a follow-up question or make another comment? Then we'll go to you, Harry Casey. Uh, I mean, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, 
I mean, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I mean, I know I got to make my comments like when the, like when I raised my question. Um, so here are my two, uh, a couple of comments. Like one is that, yes, I mean, yes to what that student just said uh, about having to work simultaneously for a, to make a livelihood, spend several hours trying to make a livelihood, and at the same time, go to school. Um, in the process, the crisis is the crisis of education itself. There's a crisis of educational quality that uh, teachers like me are, uh, I mean, are delivering in the classroom. So, th so that's one thing. The other is that, uh, I mean, I want to affirm what Carol Lang said a few minutes back about uh, the union being afraid of its power, afraid of striking. Um, and uh, in the context of the Taylor Law, I want to like emphasize that uh, all the successes that have been underlined to us in the speech by Mark Kagan and others um, have underlined the necessity of moral legitimacy. I mean, a strike succeeds when it has the moral legitimacy behind it. That moral legitimacy is an integral part of what some of my other comrades have been calling common sense. Common sense is a Gramscian term, but if that term has got any substantive content, it is this. It has to have moral legitimacy. I mean, a strike today um, has to have that moral legitimacy. Increasingly, what we are finding is the rising level of this legitimacy. Okay, so, so that's the second thing I wanted to say. Um, and the third thing that I wanted to say is that some of the concrete ways that Comrade Arena has pointed out are for us to take up, for one, the strike fund. Let's make that concrete. Sure. Second, study groups. Let's make that solidly concrete. There are so many things that we can do as, I mean, as a means of raising our level of consciousness and by doing so, helping our students raise their level of consciousness. And by doing so, building a larger collaborative framework outside of the campus as well. That's it. Thank you, Ganesh. Harry Kaysen. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, I just wanted to add to what I said earlier. I, that's, um, I am, yeah, I'm on mic. Uh, on mic. Um, so I just wanted to add to what I said earlier about um, getting um, community support for, for us. And I would, rec I, I would really think it would be great uh, if, we, if Chris's presentation would be made available to all of any one of us could go out into the communities and, and give this presentation and, and try to explain why uh, it's harder and harder to get a college education. And the, we, the way we would link up with the communities is by having the students um, uh, uh, that, that go to church here or go to a community center here, uh, 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 they would reach out for us and get us a, uh, an opportunity to, to present to the community uh, what basically Chris uh, Santiago uh, presented to us today. And uh, I think we'd, we'd make a lot of headway uh, with the community if we were to, uh, to do that. And I, I would certainly be glad to, uh, to go to any uh, community group, a church. I think churches would be great. Now, I know with the, the pandemic, we'd ha have to be online, uh, but I imagine this there is an awful lot of online groups out there that we could reach out and the students uh, who uh, go to some of these groups and, uh, and meet up groups and churches that uh, they would be able to give us a, um, a, an end to, to talk uh, seriously about their future, about their future and why um, uh, education should be free and, and why they should not have to work uh, 20 or 40 hours a week uh, to while they're going to to school. So uh, uh, just again, uh, just try and throw out some ideas. Thank you, Harry. Can I can uh, I just can I just say something about that and and what? Please. And then uh, we'll go to Caroline. Yes, please. Uh, you know, um, uh, Aslam talked about strategy and tactics, and Harry's talking about community support, you know, when we think about a strike, right, when might it happen? The, the, uh, the weird thing about 
public employees and strike prohibition is normally when we think about a strike, it's at contract expiration, right? But since it's illegal for us to strike any time, I don't know that that applies so much, you know, like, what does it matter if we illegally strike in the middle of a contract or at the end of it? You know, but if, if, but there's a certain logic, right? Like people have it in their heads, right? Like, oh, at the end of a contract. So that would be one thing to think about is, okay, our contract is up in 23 months. Maybe it's 22 months. And if we said, we're, we're going to be ready, mm -hmm. we're gonna be ready in 22 months and we're gonna spend those 22 months going at it, for, first of all, formulating demands, right. right? And then going out into the community and, and, and doing consistent, consistent, consistent work during those 22 months to be ready so that on that day, we were ready. Alternatively, right, sometimes an issue comes up, like it came up for the Hunter uh, campus schools. That issue, it seems to me, we, we missed a moment back in the fall, which, would have, which was 2,300 layoffs, right? But, um, but that's the, but you know, there might be other issues, right, that would precipitate something that would all of a sudden make it clear that we needed to act. But still, you know, readiness is, is a crucial component. When we go out on strike, we want lots of people to be walking the picket lines and we want everyone else to not cross those picket lines. So, um, you know, preparation also is really important. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and I see another question about strategy uh, and activism was posed by Alex Zevin in the history department at CSI. What about presentations at some of the high schools that CSI recruits most of its students from? Interesting idea to pursue, uh, as Harry Kaysen had uh, alluded I to. Su I support. <laughs> uh, Carol Lang, I'm going to go back to you, and then uh, Luis Zaragoza, I'll go to you. Uh, thank you. I, a couple of things. One of the things I think we actually have on our side is the utter incompetence of the CUNY administration. So. The way I met, I teach at BCC and it appeared, and I'm sure this is probably true of, of most of CUNY, is that there isn't any real determination about who should go back, who shouldn't go back, who should be online, who shouldn't be online. Every department seems to be sort of fending for itself. And the, the sheer fact that these people are utterly incompetent is something we could add to our arsenal of why CUNY, we need to strike against, against CUNY. And I'm for sure certain that many of the buildings are not prepared to have people come back yet. And so one of the things we need to add to our arsenal or our list of demands is the question of safety. And I know that, that Jay put that in there, but that might be something, a real catalyst for people to ultimately want to go out because this could kill us if we go back into the buildings. And you know, the thing that I found from being in the 1989 strike when I worked at City College was that it was really, I mean, people were certainly agitating and, and having meetings and discussions, but it was almost spontaneous. There were enough people who were pissed off about at that point, the, the tuition was only $400. And the, the fact is, is that so many people were so thoroughly pissed off that it just sort of came as a, a spontaneous movement on the part of city and we connected with the rest of the city university and managed to shut the city university down. So it would be a good thing to have I think popular assemblies, I think to have these sick outs that, you know, where that Rafa is sort of beginning to organize. And that I, I think we have to expect that more and more people are participating in things that are going to ultimately end up in what appeared to be the 1989 strike, which was successful at CUNY. And even my union, I was in DC 37, agreed to support that strike, which is unheard of forever it, in DC 37. It's got to be the worst of the worst of the city unions. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, with enough going out to schools, I think that's a great idea to high schools. But 
our mass will become a, a real movement, I think, but we have to make sure that we've prepared well enough in advance with strike committees that are elected right. so that we know how to run a strike that's right. going to be successful. Right. Thank you, Carol. Paul oh, Luis, Zaragoza. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you for having me. Um, I had a few things to say, but I think the thing I want to comment on the most was what Henry was talking about with getting uh, information out there to the students. I kind of feel like this is particularly important right now, not only after decades of the ruling class working to pump misinformation into our communities in a way that builds right-wing hegemony, but also after um, the chipping away of labor power for decades. And um, I, I think a big part of this information, for adults at least, comes in the form of things like Newsmax, Fox, or Sinclair Networks stations. Uh, for students, I don't know if any of you have heard of the group Turning Points USA. They're very prevalent on a lot of college campuses. They get a lot of young people. If you've heard of people like Candace Owens, Charlie Kirk, Ben Shapiro, this is their whole sort of thing. And they go on to campuses to convince students mainly to fall into right-wing propaganda. And um, one thing that I've noticed is that I, I liked what um, Professor um, Trichur said about strikes needing moral legitimacy. They do a really good job at making anyone who's part of a union, anyone who strikes, anyone who's even socially conscious as seeming morally illegitimate. And so, um, I'm just wondering, like, is there anything on campus? I haven't noticed, but is there anything on campus that any of you know of that is more of a progressive or even left-wing version of this? Uh, rather, instead of pumping misinformation out there to push the ruling class's agenda, is there anything to get this actual information about what's going on with colleges, the price, the difficulty in maintaining your education, and then the difficulty in everyday life that you also face? Thank you, Luis. That's a very concrete question, and maybe some of our faculty, instructional staff, or other members of our college community could answer that. Does anyone know? Well, I mean, was there one more question? Did Alex have a question? And then maybe we can just go back to the panel and wrap things up unless we have more questions. But The only sure. thing I have to say is that sociology is, a, studying sociology is a good way to learn these things. You know. It's, it's sad that you have to kind of go after it yourself through a department, but it is there. I mean, but yeah, it's not like what you're talking about, Louise. Louise, the other thing I'll say is, and I always encourage my students to do this, if you're interested in starting a club or an organization, there's ways to do that on the campus, ways to get student funding for that uh, through CSI. And I'm sure you could find a willing uh, faculty advisor and you can take a DIY approach, definitely. Uh, Professor Zevin from the history department had a question. Uh, hey, sorry, uh, I've had to, the uh, lighting conditions aren't great here. Um, so I just, uh, I'm, I had to step away for a second and I'm sorry if I'm gonna repeat things that, that other people have said, um, um, uh, but I, I, I wanted to make a couple, uh, quick comments and also kind of a question. Um, in terms of building solidarity within our, our, among our dues paying member, it seems to me that something I've noticed among faculty is that there's a, there's a disconnect which shouldn't really be there between the outrage that many, many faculty feel, I would say the vast majority of full-time faculty and part-time faculty that I've, that I've spoken to about the governance plan change, the unilateral act uh, on the part of the president to simply do away with what remains of campus democracy such as it is, and, and, uh, and then uh, a sort of more tepid reaction when we talk about organizing uh, to, to build a, a power for a strike. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that, that the conversations that we started to have, these phone calls we started to have with people, is, the two things are inherently connected when we reimagine what we want our university to be like and the idea of self-governance that we uh, as faculty members should have uh, more say, not less, in how the, the university is governed. And, and that, that is a bread and butter issue as well, because, of course, uh, um, the, uh, the CARES Act funding that the, that the administration has received it has not been distributed, could be distributed easily to rehire adjuncts and to, to pay our measly raises that, we, that we're owed. So maybe that's something to be emphasized when, we, when we're talking to faculty. The, the other thing I think is that, Mark, I just wanted to say to, to, to Mark Kagan that 
your presentation on the Taylor Law is, is so helpful as a history lesson. Um, if we're going to go around doing presentations at, 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 at churches and at the high schools and so on, you might think about going around to our departments on campus and try and explain to people what the Taylor Law has really meant in practice and, and um, the avenues and paths that are open for us to, to potentially defy it, whether that's through lobbying at Albany or whether it's through actually taking actions ourselves. Um, and the other thing is, is I just wanted to say in response to something Carol said um, about the sort of maybe that we're coming back to a moment like the, the 89 strike. Um, I don't know if anyone's spoken about it. I know Ruth was involved, Ruth Silverberg was involved um, um, with the grad students that are, you know, Columbia is out on strike, the grad students are out on strike. That's a very serious strike. Um, and, and, um, and, and I know uh, I have friends who are organizing the graduate student union at NYU and they have just taken a vote to go out on strike and, and, and there's, our, there's discussions there about what is going to happen with, with Labor Relations Board and, and, and all sorts of issues about police off campus, Black Lives Matter. Um, it's very, very serious. And I just wonder if, you know, if any of the panelists or anyone in the audience has a sense of, of connecting to those struggles, because it does seem like we're in a moment where higher education is in revolt. And it's the graduate students who are taking the lead, even, even I think within our, with our, within our own sphere, the, 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 the students at the grad center. So I just wondered if people could talk a little bit about ways to connect to that, or if they think that we are in a moment like that. Sorry to ramble. Thank you, Alex. Well, since we're at 8.03, could we have uh, each of our speakers do a, a wrap up here? Uh, and then we'll call it a night, because I think we've had people dutifully here for about two hours, and I'm sure some of, some of our students need to eat, take care of their families, study, et cetera. So how about we have a wrap up of one minute each for each person? Okay. Chris, do you want to start? And sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't even, I'm not sure what to say besides, I totally agree with what uh, Alex just said and Luis as well. Um, you know, how do we get the students to be more aware of what's going on and they're kind of more aware of their own interest in all of this and also to c connect to I mean, we are in a moment of total crisis so uh, we yeah i mean we have to get people to kind of wake up to this if they're not already awoke i mean they should be but if they're not we have to continue trying to wake them up and um the, the it's only going to be a stronger movement if we have grad students i went to columbia you know i mean i could i could probably make contacts there if i needed to if we were if you know we just need to kind of make the connections and support each other um so that's i guess for the future so thank you everybody thank you chris uh mark kagan concluding no. Alexander, I was frightened by the concept that I, I will have to go department by department uh, throughout CUNY, but, <laughs> but we need to create cadres of people that are capable of doing that. And, you know, to a certain extent, I think that will be easier once we're back in person. Um, I just, I want to promote something and just make a, a, a connection to it. So the mention of Francis Fox Piven reminded me of this conference, so it's, okay. it's academics, but being held at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, I think on April 23rd, around this book called Working Class New York. And the premise of the book was that for a couple of decades after World War II, the working class had real political power in New York and really exercised through its unions. And then that was lost. And the afternoon sessions, one is about what the book calls social democratic New York, the New York of those decades where with free tuition and a low transit fare and, um, and other things like that and, and rent control. Um, and, uh, and then, and then a, a session on what uh, working class New York would look like in the future today and how to get there, which I think Francis is, is speaking on that panel. You know, and someone along the line talked about um, promoting the teacher strikes, and that's good, and we should be looking for higher ed examples as well. But you know what? In New York, we could be this far, right? If we are in some ways positioned, someone said DC 37, oh, they're really dead. 
yeah, we're not quite so dead, right? And there's more capability in some ways for the rank and file to, to make its voice heard in this union and in many other unions. And, you know, we could be that spark, but we just have to work at it. Um, so thanks. Thanks for inviting me tonight. Great. Thank you, Mark. Jay Arena. Yeah, so I want to um, come back to my original um, argument about the bargaining and striking for the common good, striking for the whole class. And in response to Ozlam, my colleague, I think she just left, but she had an interesting uh, chat, a, a post uh, about striking. Um, and then Alex's point about connecting to the other struggles. And then my great former student, Luis Zaragoza, how to connect him in. So, you know, uh, so there's a little bit of pushback, at least from some quarters here, on the idea of the striking for the common good, the striking for the, for the class-wide demands. Um, but we, we need to flip that. And, and that's what uh, uh, Oslam did in her post. She said, well, you're not crazy about that, but is that a serious strategy to go out like the, 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 the demands that we've usually brought up? Um, at the bargaining table, which also are problematic, the way the PSC negotiates in closed door sessions, not opening up, uh, which we also should do when we come closer to this next round of bargaining. Uh, is that really realistic, keeping it those narrow demands, also abiding by the strictures of the Taylor Law, all designed to limit our power not to strike, and also keeping the demands as limited as possible? I think more realistic, yes, is raising and demanding in violation of the, of the uh, repressive um, uh, Taylor law that we raise these demands, particularly around students. I think this should be the whole list that I brought up, right? Connecting the entire living conditions of our students to our working conditions, but particularly around a free higher ed. I mean, Melania Nunes, my student, uh, you know, 58 hours, that's just, that's just crazy. That's, you know, those, that's criminal, those kind of conditions that our students are being subjected to. Um, so we do need to strike on those, and that's how we connect with those other fights. Yeah, I mean, we need to go on strike, but with those, with those broad set of uh, demands, and we do need, as Alex also brought up, the, the deep conversations uh, with our co-workers and with other students. But we also, I think, have to have a real strategy, you know, about how we're going to win. And the, uh, the argument, the strategic argument that we have to bring students into the fight and how do you do that has to be, uh, has to be front and center. And on that point of bringing our students in, Luis and others, you should join in on our uh, action committee. We welcome students to join in, to join in that fight, and we could the students could organize an educational, uh, you know. And and finally, uh, the last point, uh, you know, we do have this recorded. So even if we can't bring Mark or Chris is, cannot do a presentation, we do have this recording, which we want to circulate as much as possible. Thank you, Jay. Well, I'd like to thank the CSI PSC Chapter Action Committee for organizing this. I'd like to thank once again um, our three speakers, Chris Santiago, Mark Kagan, John J. Arena, for their presentations. I'd especially like to thank everyone who gave their time this evening to attend, to participate, to give your views. So uh, we're going to conclude tonight. I do hope you stay in touch with any of these organizations that have been posted in the chat. We'll get on the email list that uh, Jay Arena mentioned. You can put your non-CSI email address in the chat box, and he'll take care of that. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening, Professor. OK, you too. Arena. Thanks. Glad you could make it. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Hey, bye bye. Good to see you. It was nice seeing you again, Professor Kazan, and I'll see you next Friday, Professor Arena. Okay. Nice you, Emily. It's Chris Bennett. Thank you. I, Great presentation. I used to sit in oh. the front of your class all the time. I was like the only student. Oh.
participating. Yeah, yeah, Chris, I knew I knew that was that was the case, but I I wasn't absolutely sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's the hair. You can't forget the hair. That's right. <laughs> well, it's great to see you again. Yeah, you too. Harry, where are you these days? Are you still teaching at CSI? Yeah, online. Okay. online. So you never stopped, even after you retired. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't stop. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working with some other groups, uh, and okay. this would this would fit right in yeah. uh, if we can get uh, get going. Mark, you did a great job on sharing. Very yeah, very that, well done. yeah, that was good, Mark. Do we want to stop recording? Oh yeah, let me do that. You're right. <laughs>